Music industry leaders in the UK are voicing concerns the post-Brexit trade deal could put the future of live music in doubt. A research collaboration in Birmingham has been exploring the live music industry and engaging with stakeholders and the public to look at the issues and potential solutions. Dr. Patricia Rosbitka is a senior lecturer at Aston University and a research lead in the Birmingham Live Music Project. Her focus is on the role of interest groups in policymaking and live music industry regulation in the UK. Dr. Rosbirka, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for the invitation for the interview. Even before the pandemic, there was some concern around the live music industry in the UK and the impact that Brexit would have. Just how great a national asset is the industry and the associated music tourism to the UK? Um, one of the things which we have to understand about uh, music industry and production, import and export related with it is that UK market is extremely developed. It's one of the most advanced in Europe. And the estimated value of the music industry in the UK is around 5.8 billion pounds a year, which actually constitutes quite a leverage sum. And that includes, for example, live even performances, but also production, um, including also, for example, link with that music tourism. So people traveling and spending money around the live events that they participate in. Well, you've been involved with this issue for a number of years now. Tell us about the live, at the Birmingham Live Music Project rather. What did it reveal about the biggest potential challenges that Brexit could pre present? So we started working on the project already around three years ago. We started from a very simple um, question that we are working on jointly with my, with my team. Um, so colleagues from Birmingham City University and from Newcastle University joined together and started asking questions. Well, Brexit is coming. What effect, what direct impact will it have on the live music? And our perspective was slightly different from the usual one. Instead of just doing broader economic calculations, we asked like, if we take a locality as for example, Birmingham, what direct impact will it have on um, live music events which take place in the city? So the venues in which they take place, but also musicians that would play from Birmingham that would play around the world and Europe. Um, and also like, things related with its regulation at the national and European level, what kind of impact will it have on the livelihood of a lot of people, people related with live music industry, like support crews, production companies. So kind of all focus from this locality perspective, but it's also the sociocultural impact that Brexit potentially will have um, on the events taking place. So, um, across the years and the um, interaction with various stakeholders, we came up with a list of um, the most kind of, um, I wouldn't say positive, uh, the most negative um, aspects which we have to take in consideration. And all of it taken from the perspective of Birmingham as a locality, the thing which is happening here, the live music events which would take place here, or the bands, musicians, crews traveling from Birmingham somewhere else. Um, so this includes, for example, issues with the supply chains. So we understand events, live music events taking place as two hours gig in the venue and the band and potentially the place in which it takes place. But in reality, it's a whole number of people, buyers, businesses around it, which are linked to that event. So just to kind of elaborate a bit more, on a one night, we would have, for example, manager of the venue being present, sound engineer, sometimes in addition, um, uh, video and light engineer. On top of that, um, probably crew at the bar, uh, tour manager with the band, depending on, obviously on the size of the band. But there are also a lot of little businesses around that area, which, for example, provide food, which people eat on the way, um, taxis, um, public transport, which is being used. So kind of having a very uh, elaborate approach into the analysis. So anything which affects production of that one night is not just, oh, gig is not happening. It's rather the whole su supply chain linked to that. So it kind of has a ripple effect on it. Um, the other aspect linked to that directly are high-end production companies. 
So not only those little events taking place in the smaller venues below 400 capacity, but also the crews which prepare larger um, touring across Europe that they deliver the equipment, they do the installation, set up the stages and so on. Majority of the large companies are the production crews. Um, some of the best ones are actually placed in the United Kingdom. So traditionally, for example, um, larger bands coming from US, Canada also, um, they would land in the UK, hire that crew directly in the UK and travel with them across the European Union. With the new restrictions and limitations, that kind of puts it all in question. Um, both on the crew itself, so basically what's going to happen with them, will they be able to travel, but also the bands from US, because that will increase their costs of traveling across the European Union, performing, not mentioning the administrative burden. Um, and those kind of are like more nitty gritty uh, elements, but there are a few points which are very important. With all these restrictions, additional cost, a lot of bands and artists will decide, well, actually, that's going to cost us too much. We're not going to travel to UK. So in that sense, there will, we're a bit worried, um, well, a bit worried, it starts actually showing up, that there will be less and less variety in available acts in UK, which will potentially lead to the homogenization of the music scene, not only in the country, but especially in smaller cities. Because London by itself is very rarely at the risk. There will be a lot of population. There will be more motivations to go there. But going for a whole tour across UK, so other cities than London, a lot of bands will wonder twice if they really want to do it, if they want to really kind of invest when the return is not that big. So that's the homogenization of the scene. On the other side, something which we already start noticing is also a cultural pushback. So why would bands, for example, from France and Germany travel to UK when there is like simply an environment which is not very supportive to that visit? So in that sense, they will be less interested in visiting the country. Um, and the final kind of point, which I think um, is useful to consider, taking also my background and focus on um, policy making and participation of various stakeholders, something which we discovered and I don't want confirm that across the years in the project. Um, on one side is a lack of sustainable develop, um, sustainable um, debate on the topic. So one of the elements is the current situation with, for example, petition for visa and um, for um, musicians and crews which travel with them. The issue has been there from the very beginning, but simply because of other issues came in, there was lack of bandwidth of dealing with it. It was issue which was postponed. So almost a year later, after COVID, um, some of the elements of COVID are kind of being um, sorted out because of vaccination process, because of the new protocols being available. Some of the issues which should have been sorted out long time ago are now surfacing, simply because before there was no uh, bandwidth at the national level to actually deal with the issue. So it's a bit sad story in the sense that, for example, um, negotiations about agriculture, fishery, are there a priority? There's more people to deal with it. Why the music industry, which has an extreme contribution to the UK economy, has been left for so long alone without a larger support. Well, you can certainly see how far reaching the implications of this are. When you were approaching this project, how important and how unprecedented was it to bring all those many stakeholders in the industry to the table? And what kind of feedback has public dialogue provided in this regard? Right. So when we were starting, so very early stages already um, in 2018, 19, one of the things which we found extremely rewarding was the fact that bringing different types of stakeholders to the table, educate them, not in the more traditional university way, but um, brings in for understanding of the situation on both sides of the table. Just to kind of give a very practical example. On one side, you have, for example, venue owners complaining about um, regulation in the city, which is not very supportive, uh, which doesn't take in consideration the interest of the venues. Um, and it's kind of very um, all fits all um, like kind of 
approach which covers everything, but it doesn't really sort out the issues. On the other side, you had policymakers, um, which kind of create the policy making uh, policies because that's the main role. But they don't know, for example, how venues are organized. That it's not always just a room like six by six square meters. Um, and the same thing, one of the um, nicest ones, I think, which kind of counts here, is the fact when you have musicians coming into the table, so the performers, who bring with them the crew, so sound engineers, um, lighting engineers, but also agents and promoters, which all kind of fit in into the whole ecology approach in production of the event. Um, but in reality, don't really know much about each other and how the general top-down approach affects them in practical terms. So I think that was like really one of the elements which really um, turned out to be beneficial to so bringing people together and creating mutual understanding. But also the fact that, especially during duration of our project, because we were quite lucky in the sense we started um, before the um, COVID pandemic, was the fact that within the last few months, the whole process speeded up extremely. So before people, they join in, it was like kind of willing partners, we exchanging and so on. Currently, they are all, because of the effects of the pandemic and a really dramatic situation, they are all being forced to talk. And now because of those experiences, which we developed before, it's becoming a bit easier, at least at the regional level. Well, as we said off the top, the project was always much more than research in an initial report. It was meant to be the first step in a bigger strategy to identify solutions and provide some recommendations to secure the future of the music industry. How far into that phase did the project get and what did it yield? Right. So currently we're in the final stages of the project. So we concluded already all our workshops and panel discussions. We finished the interviews and um, currently working on the outputs. Um, some of the work will be published relatively shortly in our final project report, um, but also videos and documentaries, which we are preparing as a part of the whole project. Mostly to make sure that the results that we produce are not just dry academic documentation, but rather bring in a bit more perspective, more information to people that really need that information. Um, some of the things um, that we're currently working on is actually a list of recommendations as an important element of an uh, output of the project. Um, and those especially are bringing out um, quite a lot of way of thinking about various things which were developed either because of Brexit or COVID more recently. Um, but some of the very interesting aspects, and here I think are worth of mentioning, is um, how the live music industry is actually viewed. We have this aspect when it is viewed as an industry, so it's an economic uh, build up, bringing money, um, important for the economy and so on. But on the other side, it's part of the art sector, which is much more creative. It's um, in other countries, very, very, very restricted in similar ways. So one of those larger kind of findings and recommendations from our side is actually changing understanding of the light music industry in a broader sense, recognizing it on one side as a full production industry in the sense with supply chains, different actors being involved and how they fit in, in the structure, but also understanding it, it's not necessarily purely arts and creative culture approach. So it's not only the artists themselves, but actually crew that supports them, the venues which are there. So kind of broader understanding of the topic. I think the kind of the largest part, um, which we are extremely like focused on, was also viewing um, the value of the industry beyond the economic impact. So kind of looking at the social culture aspect, and especially at the um, regional level, the city level, but also in especially now in the pandemic times, when we're actually kind of deprived of the possibility of actually attending live events. Here, extremely fascinating aspect is that the people that we talked with, not only the artists, but actually the audiences, the game goers, that they recognize um, that without that live element, the industry itself, it's interesting, but the live element brings it, so to say, to life, makes it more interesting. 
uh, makes it more fascinating. And then obviously kind of with an eye for the future, we're looking for the international partners to kind of um, expand the project. So in that sense, we have done it now in Birmingham, comparing it also um, to a degree to different cities within the UK. But we're looking at it from currently looking into partnerships and in, with other countries in order to kind of take it beyond just understanding of the local aspect and seeing how um, how we can measure the differences between cities abroad. Well, optimistically, we're heading towards a new normal and the industry will rebound, hopefully, and retool once the vaccine is available worldwide and live events will return. And it's also in the best interest of musicians and other creatives all across Europe for a mutually beneficial visa-free travel provision. Are you optimistic that this is going to work itself out? Where is this headed? Whew, optimistic. Um, so... There are things uh, which obviously will be sorted quite easily. So there are, um, for example, the issues with uh, VAT aspects of like smaller things, which are of course important, like car traveling, um, transport of the crew, transport of the merchandise and production of the merchandise and so on. Um, eventually in the long-term perspective, we'll probably also come back to the level of interactions that we had before. So exchanges, cultural exchanges, bands traveling one way and the other. Um, what I'm however really worried about is that it's gonna be only the bands and, and the crews which can afford it. So we're talking here about, well, Ed Sheeran and Adele, they still will be able to travel without larger issues. What at current stage and in the very near future um, is at risk is actually those bands which, you know, they're starting in the garage at one of the friends doing some practice occasionally on the rehearsal studios and playing in really small venues, both in UK and outside of the UK. And I think the worry is about actually those small kind of bands which were just starting up and kind of giving them the chance to get better at what they're doing practicing, doing more culture exchanges. So kind of this very beginning of the process when they still don't have that much of their fan base and so on. But those culture exchanges, the traveling on the tours, um, dealing with administration and things like that, that, that develops them to certain stage of, of their career when they can, for example, be signed by the label when life is then slightly easier. But the problem is um, with current restrictions, and issues related with Brexit, they will not be able to do it because they will have to be fluent in the administration of visa regimes for different uh, EU member states. Um, they will have to afford and have additional resources on their bank account to do it. Um, and simply for a lot of them, it's not going to be a viable option. It's not going to be any more jumping to the van, driving with the friends for two, three weeks and coming back after having gigs because they simply will come back quite bankrupt without any um, information on if it worked out, because what about production of merchandise, CDs, music that they will sell. So in that sense, I'm a bit more worried about the, the beginners rather than the advanced artist. And here kind of looking at it um, from the broader perspective, there are opportunities for, um, by, which can be developed by both government and um, different forms of associations like musicians union, um, music venue trusts and different types of organizations re relevant for the music industry to help them with that. But it doesn't mean it's gonna be easy process. And a lot of those young artists will kind of go, it's not worth the hassle. So in that sense, I am a bit pessimistic, especially for the smaller bands, but I'm hoping for the best. That, so eventually in long term, there will be a solution. It's the short term, which I'm more worried about. Well, there is a long and vibrant music heritage to uphold and here's hoping that we'll see a future as rich and as diverse as the past. Dr. Rosbivka, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with Newspoint360 today. Thank you so much for the invitation.